Napoleon once said that if the earth were a single state, Istanbul, or Constantinople's original quote, would be its capital. Well, we have to give the general credit because he clearly knew his geography. Istanbul is the meeting point of Europe and Asia to the east and the west. It's the meeting point of the Black Sea and the Mediterranean to the north and the south. It's also the ancient convergence of the Silk Road and the Spikes Road, so that's why the Ottoman Empire and Istanbul were so wealthy, because all this commerce and tariffs and merchants and everything were passing through it. And Istanbul, or Constantinople, was the pit stop for pilgrims going to Mecca or Jerusalem. So whether you were Muslim or Christian, depending on where you were coming from, you typically stopped in the city. So the point is that in the pre-modern period, any soldier, merchant, or pious person had to pass through the city. And with that much cultural interaction going on, it's no surprise that even today, Turkish food is the original fusion cuisine. Since human history, civilization, and culture converge in one place, you can make the argument that Turkish food is sort of an archaeological record of the entire human experience. So that's a little bit of a grandiose statement, but just bear with me for one second. On the far eastern side of Turkic civilization, the Uyghurs and others border China, and you have the Central Asian Turkic people who created the forefather of today's Chinese dumplings. On the far western side, you have kebabs, eggplant dishes, and other Mediterranean cuisines that many swear is actually Greek food and not Turkish. And don't get us started on the whole argument that this or that dish is actually Turkic or Turkish, but the Greeks stole it and vice versa. Well, to sort all of this out, there's no better person on planet Earth to untangle all of this and help us understand what's going on than Derek Emai. He's a host of the YouTube channel Meet Turkey, which explores the depths of Istanbul society, culture, and food. And it's sort of a mixture of Guy Fieri's Food Network show, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, and the travel writing of Rick Steves, all tied together with a good dose of Ottoman and Turkish history. And you can find his channel and also free cooking videos on meetturkey.io, and that's two T's in Meet Turkey, and it's M-E-E-T Turkey, uh, to be able to find that. So we discuss a lot in this episode. First of all, this is interesting tidbit, that yogurt was originally fermented horse milk made to feed the horseback mounted warriors in Central Asia, including those in Genghis Khan's army. So this is the forefather of today's Danone or Chobani yogurt. We also discussed the fusion of Arabic and Mediterranean cuisine, which produced delights like baklava, and also head scratch scratching curiosities that mix sweet and savory, like one dish called chicken pudding. Trust us, the word sounds much better than the original Turkish. Finally, the strange names of Turkish dishes that translate terribly into English. One like the Sultan's Delight, the Imam Fainted, and most curiously, Women's Thigh. So Derek is a great friend. He knows a lot about all of this stuff, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Derek Emai. Mr. Emai, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. So your YouTube channel has received noted praise in the international media. It's been, <laughs> it's been called uh, The Thinking Man's Guy Fieri, who's the host of Food Network's Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. That, Triple D meets Rick Steves, the travel writer, meets uh, Macho Man, right, but, and also meets uh, Macho Man R Randy Savage in his prime. Um, now, I shouldn't mention that that quote from the international media was something I just completely made up myself, but um, I think um, that's... <laughs> How, would you describe your show in that way or in another way? Well, I mean, yeah, we've obviously got the bleached tips uh, component <laughs> and the chokers that are the hallmark um, of Mr. Fieri. Uh, I think it's actually Fieri, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind pronouncing it with the proper Italian uh, <laughs> pronunciation. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I would like to think, you know, it really just be, due to the, the nomenclature common to say your... your TikTok audience, um, you know, we're trying to really speak the language of the people while maintaining the uh, intellectual depth and fortitude necessary uh, to showcase uh, some of the cuisines and cultures of one of the greatest places on earth. So yes, and obviously, I mean, my rugged good looks and um, what would be the word, uh, daunting physique would definitely capture a macho man uh, title, I do say. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, so... Listeners jumping in probably think, wait, what is he talking about? Um, all right, so to get down to it, um, Derek I've known very long, uh, knows more about food than almost anyone I know, but has also lived in Istanbul for a very long time and knows uh, Turkish society, Istanbul society very well. 
Uh, I've on this show had a couple of guests who've looked at history through the perspective of cuisine. And um, a lot of people can understand that. They'll know little tidbits about, oh, this little bit of American cuisine um, comes from this particular culture. But we also understand that a lot of what constitutes the American diet is um, processed food made by large corporations that basically came out after World War II. And different country cultures have a whole different thing going on. And um, your channel gets into Turkish cuisine, but I think we should probably get into Turkish food. Um, what is it and why is it unique? That is a great question. And and I think I, I almost want to caveat here with there are like wars about these kinds of things. Like whose is baklava? Do <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just right. So I'm I'm gonna go ahead and just and, and dive into some of the staples of Turkish cuisine with the caveat that you may say, hey, isn't that part of X, Y, or Z cuisine? Very well might mm -hmm. be the case. But I think just as, as a broad spread for what is typically known in the international community as Turkish cuisine, I mean, you've got kebab, right? Kebabs in Turkish. You've got kebabs, you've got baklava, you have Turkish coffee. And I mean, I think those are some of the more well-known things. But I, I think the thing that I've discovered being here in Turkey is there's such a wide variety of regional cuisines. Um, and I mean, as Scott has mentioned, kind of a depth of... Uh, historical background to these things so yeah it, it, it there how do i put it it's there's a lot more here than just the kebab though that is definitely famous and definitely good also worth noting is the meat on a spit that is shaved off you might know as gyros or shawarma in turkey it's called donash i mean in uh, mexican cuisine it's called oh i'm blanking on it all possible like all, there it is. yeah it, Except their, uh, the El Pastor kebabs are so pathetically small compared to a doner, <laughs> which like a doner is like, it's an, it's basically, it's a skewer. They're turning the meat. It's like an entire cow of meat. Like how many pounds of meat is on one of those skewers? It's crazy. I mean, honestly, I think it, it, it depends on the volume of the restaurant, but I mean, there are literally some I could not wrap my arms around. You know, I mean, it was just, this is a glorious thing. But yeah, they're huge. So. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, um. Because, I mean, like, I would read things about little historical tidbits about food where um, there, there are some Turkish food where if you know about Greek food, you think, okay, that's just it by a different name. And, like, totally. the names of Greek food and Turkish food, it's um, Ispinakla. Like you know. Yes. Right. Where, you know, you can see, like, right. the root word of spinach in both of them. But it's um, mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. But then there's stuff that's, like, really not Greek. It's... Um, like, I mean, kebab restaurants in Istanbul, you've mentioned on your channel that where they have stuff from like basically near the border of Iraq or Syria. So, yeah, like, can, can you pin? Yeah, it's just like Turkish cuisine. It's not one thing, but it's this mishmash of all these different things um, are, uh, I don't know, like w restaurants that you've been to and profiled it where they like highlight this is a certain type of food or this is a type yeah, of totally. cuisine from this type of like vil village. Like, what are things that spring to your mind there? Yeah, I mean, there's, in terms of some broader groupings, I mean, you've got like, say, uh, restaurants from the Karadeniz or like the Black Sea region, you know, and there's some very specific dishes from the Black Sea region of Turkey. Um, like there's a, a particular breakfast breakfast dish that goes by two different names, uh, Kuymak and I uh, can't think of the other one. Um, I So it's basically butter, cheese, and corn flour mixed together into this delicious paste. I mean, actually, I, I had it once served over the top of a piece of toasted bread with some mushrooms and uh, dill and a poached egg. I mean, it really reminded, the taste profile was very similar to like a croque madame, if you've ever had that. I mean, it was fantastic. But I mean, that's an example. So you have Karadeniz restaurants, so you have regional ones like that. You'll have... Um, like Adana is a region of Turkey, and they have a, a specific kind of kebab restaurant. With they actually have a kebab named after them, Adana kebab. It's a minced meat, like ground beef kebab, pressed onto a stick um, and then grilled over fire. Uh, you've got um, ev yemekleri, which is like home foods, sort of like these are some more like traditional Turkish foods you might see served in a home. Uh, you've got those kinds of restaurants. I mean, there's just a variety of different types of restaurants uh, with a variety of different types of foods. And uh, like the evolution of certain foods is um, really interesting. Um, when uh, I had a guest on who talked about like the culinary history of different foods, he said that one thing that in the 21st century, 20th century, that doesn't exist in the same way that was very common in the past is uh, a mixture of sweet and savory. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
this is something that uh, when I had foreigners in Istanbul, I'd always try to bring them to and get them to eat, and they thought they were being punked. Um, was this um, dessert, uh, it's a uh, chicken pudding. I don't know what, I forget what it's called in Turkish, but is that what it's translated yeah, yeah. to in English? Yeah, it's like, it's I'm, chicken, it's like chicken yes. breast. And then what's put on uh -huh. top of it? Um, it's not like tapioca the way we would think, but what's the stuff they put on there? So the word muhalebe, which <laughs> loosely translated into English as pudding. Um, I mean, it's, it's a Turkish dish that, I mean, it, think of pudding you could cut. I don't know if that sounds appealing to you, but almost, almost <laughs> like a, a, almost like a mochi. Do you know what I mean? With that kind of consistency, and I think some of the original ones, you know, they were made with rice flour actually. But it's you've got this like milk uh, rice flour stabilizer kind of thing with sweetness, and then I, from apparently the in, the chicken influences from Arabian cuisine, right? And so they started putting shreds of chicken breast into it, which. Actually, I mean, I, I think it tastes quite good. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't yeah, know. I mean, I like being half Japanese, like the whole mochi connection thing here, you know, I think that it's very interesting, very unique. And it's, and too, the, those restaurants, the muhale bijilak, the, the places that serve those kind of puddings and or just broader milk products in general, like um, clotted cream and yogurt and that sort of things, sometimes will actually even serve chicken soup. Or tabuk lupilav, which is like chicken and rice, because you got to use the rest of the chicken for something, yeah. right? So put the chicken breast into the pudding, which as a sentence I've never said, and then you can put the rest of the chicken into, you know, other different forms. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, but that muhalibi is, uh, yeah, I, I really actually, I think it's fantastic. There's another version where after they make it, they kind of cook it over an open flame, and it kind of toasts or burns the bottom, and they call it kazandibi, which is like bottom of the cauldron. Also a Turkish uh, slang term for your last child, uh, but you know, <laughs> so we have a kazan dibi, let's say. <laughs> I'll have to get into that in the weird names of food because I think one of the favorite episodes of yours that you did is that. But <laughs> one more thing before we get into that. Um, so totally. muhalebe, muhalebe, this Turkish pudding, again, I sound like uh -huh. I'm a weird translation on a restaurant. So that's that's a pretty straightforward like Turkish dessert thing, right? And then, so from best totally. as you understand the, the chicken mixed with this pudding, is um, kind of like this Arab Turk fusion, if you think correctly. Yeah, well, and I mean, and so even, yeah, to that point, the fusion, I mean, you've got to think about the history of the Turkish people, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got a nomadic, I mean, the, the Turkic kind of ethno-linguistic swath was all the way up into northwestern China. You know, and yeah. so you have this big, broad region where the cuisine has developed um, from the movement of the peoples and the various geographies and their interactions with their cultures, you know, and so... I mean, so it really makes sense that you'd have, say, an Arabian influence on the cuisine. I mean, e even in the Ottoman Empire, I think, um, like, so with muhalebe specifically and the, the chicken version uh, with the influence, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, they also had a version that didn't have chicken in it, and they topped it with rose water. You know, and so you've got kind of a, a very, a, a similar sweet, milky flavor profile, but with a lot of, like, the floral side um, as well. So, yeah. One of my uh, favorite memories of if you, um, I mean, you've had this experience many times, you're bringing Americans or family members to different restaurants. And a lot of what foreigners, when they first encounter Turkish food, it's almost universal praise of like, oh, this is incredible. I love it. But there's like certain cuisines where you can tell their brain can't compute what's going on. <laughs> And it's like they're they're looking at the uncanny valley, like in movies where there's CGI that tries to look human, but it's not. And for mm. my sister and brother-in-law, I took them to this chicken pudding restaurant and I ordered myself a big portion and I wanted to like get it for them. Um, but I did give them the option of like choosing before they ordered and I was Arr! just wolfing it down. And I could tell they were trying to be polite um, <laughs> and like, oh, um, I think that... Uh, I'll have one of those desserts instead. And uh, because like you said, some of these places that they have other chicken savory dishes, they're smelling the chicken soup, but then it's this mixed with dessert. Um, and they're, they're, they they can't just mix it in. Oh, like speaking of um, brain cognitive dissonance, something mm. that I didn't know how to compute at first, but then I grew to love from the deepest depths of my heart is Iran. Um, oh, which gosh, I mean, yeah. it's like, this is like so basic. We almost forget to mention it. Um, but, yeah, totally. um, oh, gosh. It, you, you have one of my favorite descriptions of Iran I've heard about like the seawater thing. So please tell us <laughs> your description <laughs> and what is Iran yeah. and how it's That's the state of Turkish description. <laughs> but for a first so, timer, it's kind of true. Yeah. 
Well, you got to kind of, it's, it's like yogurt mixed with seawater, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, but in the best possible way, like it's really <laughs> sublime. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've really gotten to the point where I'm kind of a snob about Iron. There's actually a spectrum of Iron taste from like cottage cheesy to the other side. It's almost like milky kombucha. Um, the superior yeah. end is the latter. However, I, I appreciate an Iron from anywhere on the spectrum. But yeah, I mean, yogurt is such a big part right, of Turkish culture, and I mean, the word we use, yogurt, is from Turkish, from yoğurmak, right, to, to thicken, basically. I mean, it, it's quintessential, and so they have developed a way to consume it faster, right? Like, <laughs> you mix it with some water, you add a little salt, and you can put it back, because I guess that idea of a savory beverage, too, there, that is some culinary cognitive dissonance for uh, at least someone with an American palate, um, but I mean, it's fantastic. I, I try to get people to put it in their mind, in the same place they put sour cream. Like you're eating mm -hmm. like this rich, spicy, like meaty, savory dish. You wanna cut it with like something a little bit, you know, it has that, that kind of creaminess, but also kind of tanginess. That's iron. You just, it's just your beverage, it's not a topping. And, and if, they, if they can like do the kind of mental gymnastics to put it in, in that way, I, I think that people, people end up really liking it, I think, eventually. Oh yeah, I mean, after a while, like you, cr <clears throat> excuse me, you crave one after eating a rich dish to polish it off Absolutely. with one. Yeah. But yeah, f foreigners, like, yeah, or you're showing people around the city the first time they come, they, <laughs> it, it it hurts you. It just hurts your soul a little bit um, when they don't want it. You feel you feel like someone called your kid ugly when they're rejecting <laughs> Iran or okay. or. Um, Kefir, or kefir yeah. listeners, kefir um, is another <laughs> thing that is much more common. But yeah, coming back to America, totally. we call it kefir. But mm -hmm. oh, you mean kefir? It's like, yeah, if you want to say it wrong, <laughs> sure. Kefir. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, if you want to be wrong. Uh, okay, so one thing uh, I stuck a hole in later, but um, the goofy names of uh, Turkish food that when you translate it to English just sounds, sounds super, super weird. Um, and listeners, uh, check out Derek's episode on this particular topic because it's hilarious. Um, mostly if you go to the touristy parts of Istanbul, you'll have one of the best things is you get a menu. It's translated to English. It's translated terribly. Um, it sounds like by a man in his 40s who looked up literally on Google Translate what it is. And you hear you see the names of it and like what is this so please tell me some of these things because this is a great episode so i, I I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna combine this into actually two categories so it the word in turkish the word for rotisserie chicken is pilich chevirme um <laughs> chevirme also means translate can be translated as chance translate not just rotisserie so there has been a rotisserie chicken on the menu as chicken translate. So this is very meta. I really appreciate the Turks for doing this. So anytime something is poorly translated on a menu, they call it a chicken translate. You know, oh, this must be another chicken translate. For example, there's uh, this Turkish dish where it's kind of like a salsa. It's chopped up tomatoes and peppers and onions. Um, you know, it's tangy, sweet, and a little spicy. And it's called ajiznesi. I, I have definitely seen that on a menu as crushing pain, <laughs> which is a severe overestimation of actually how spicy it is. But that's my, there's another good one where I guess, you know, when you, on the door, it says push to open, right? And in Turkish, it's actually a command, like itiniz, like it's saying, you push the door, which ha has been translated, your dog um, is also <laughs> a, <laughs> a, a translation to that. So, I mean, so there are all these chicken translates, but... There really are Turkish foods that, when translated correctly, still have a crazy name. So there's an, an eggplant dish in particular called the Imam Fainted. I mean, I guess legend has it, he liked it so much that he passed out, you know. And actually, in, in Turkish, saying that you fainted is, is a way to express your admiration for something. Uh, similar to that, there's another uh, dish with eggplant as the base called Hünkar Beyende, which means the Sultan liked it. Like, wow, that must have been so quintessential. I can't imagine being like, hey, what are we having for dinner? Oh, the, the sultan liked it, or the president liked it. That's what we're having for dinner. <laughs> it's just such a weird... The, but, I mean, for me, like, the the quintessential one is Kadın Budu Köftesi, which is translated <laughs> as... Scott, would you like to do the honors? <laughs> Women's thighs. <laughs> Women's thighs meatballs. Such a weird, weird... I mean, th there's other things, too, like... Have you ever had uh, gavurda salatasa? 
it's quite I don't good. think I have, but I, I'm really but the looking name? forward to <laughs> where this uh, the explanation is. Well, I mean, what, 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 how would you translate Gavurda into English? Gavurda. The infidels. Uh, Mountain? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. it, it's just, there's just, it, but it's a kind of salad. A very good one, I might add. Um, and lastly, That's I mean. Probably, they're, they're... I don't know if that came from like a military campaign into the Balkans or where they were fighting <laughs> some Christian kingdom. That's my guess guess, but who knows? Yeah, seriously. I, the, um, yeah, the last one though, which is also a food with a weird name and a, or mainly a chicken translate, is ichli kifte. Mm -hmm. uh, ichli kifte is fantastic. I mean, if you can imagine a corn dog, but like stuffed with ground meat and pine nuts instead of a hot dog, um, no stick either. But ichli kifte. But you can translate that as sensitive meatball, which is, it's, <laughs> I mean, ichli actually means like stuffed, but sensitive meatball. I think that might be. I don't know. That, there's a, there's a lot of good ones for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, like, for listeners who are totally confused, I think it's it, there's so many things where it sounds so much better in the native language. and Totally. I mean, where Turkish is itself, how do we say this? There's when, when you were asking the host in this episode of Weird Translations and when you said, okay, women's thigh, what is this? And she was trying to strain her brain of how does this make <laughs> sense? And Turkish is, um, you can, there, there's, a, there's a romantic aura that can be expressed in so many words and a poeticness also a sexualness that can come across too also a um um lots of double entendres um profanity in turkish exists at a level that english can't even possibly approach and this is a family friendly podcast but i think in an honor shame culture oh, you have dear. to have powerful weapons to take down your opponent so profanity is um takes it to the next level in turkish um yeah, I. Oh, wow, it's. Um, I, I, I I'm getting, I'm getting all, almost misty eyed. Just <laughs> I'm getting almost misty eyed just thinking about it. Um, so many <laughs> memories and. <sighs> yeah. Yes, I I remember asking my children early on because they, they go to a Turkish school. I said, "Tell me every bad word that you know, right? Kufur is like that." I was like, "Tell me every kufur you know." So they were telling me all these words, and I'm saying, "Do you know that word in English?" They're like, "What does that mean in English?" They're like, "Well, it means like but." but in a bad way, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, so you don't even know the English equivalent for this word, but you know, you're in first or third grade and you already, you're educated, you know, you speak the local language, so. I mean, people who are otherwise very conservative would say things that when translated is pretty raunchy in English, but it's because yeah. they're only at, there's only like gentleman's profanity, which is down here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then like versus like the most vile thing you could say is two steps beyond the worst thing we could say, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I hope listeners, you, you might be wondering, what were they talking about? It's to communicate the wretchedness of the Turkish language. It's just hard to get across. But um, one thing yeah. uh, you mentioned, the, uh, the Imam fainted and um, mm -hmm. Hinkad Bandi. I really yeah. love it that they're very eggplant based, which we don't have a lot of that oh, in America. Yeah. But when you really know how to use an eggplant, think of it as mm -hmm. a vacuum cleaner for olive oil. <laughs> Um, man, how much olive oil can you put in one eggplant, like a liter? It just keeps, the saturation point is something else. It's just, it just takes and takes and takes. And, oh, absolutely. No. I mean, the, the, the way the eggplant is used in cuisine, I mean, it is really fantastic. Like roasted, I mean, the hunkar bandi, for example, the dish that we mentioned. I mean, you basically roast an eggplant on open coals, which if you're going to try this at home, please poke holes in your eggplant first so it doesn't <laughs> explode in your face. Um, you, ro you roast the eggplant close to a heat source. You peel it, you chop it up, you make a nice little roux out of butter and flour, add some milk, throw in the, the pureed eggplant and some cheese. And then on top of it, you put cubed lamb or beef that's cooked in like a tomato sauce with green peppers. I mean, it's I can see why the Sultan liked it. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, so this is uh, just kind of like shifting gears. I'm curious, like in Turkish cuisine, there's claims that this or that dish originates from, uh, let's say, the Sultan's kitchen, Hinkarbiendi. Totally. The Sultan yep. enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, and any cuisine, French cuisine, uh, Italian cuisine, has sort of a, a high cuisine, something that you would have as a totally. five-course dinner versus... This is the cheap food that a worker would just eat um, on a pinch, and it's a loaf of bread mm. with some whatever stuff thrown in it. Um, yeah. So, do you know much based on um, food that would be at the Sultan's court? And then, before we started recording, you also mentioned things that were influenced by um, saints or pilgrims or Rumi, uh, <laughs> religious mystics. Um, totally. So, b b b what are some of these cuisines that came out of different places, whether yeah. Sultan's court or elsewhere? 
So, I mean, it's interesting even looking at Turkish society today where, I mean, food is just taken very seriously at every kind of socioeconomic level, you know? And so I think when you look back at the history of Turkish cuisine, I mean, so in the Ottoman palaces, you know, people would eat off of a, is it sini? The, the big like silver tray, right? It would come, be put on the ground, people would sit around it, you would eat with your hands or with a spoon and you would just eat a little bit. You know, and so you had those kinds of maybe some big elaborate meals, but a, a lot of the foods that I read about from Ottoman uh, times, I mean, in 1923 with the foundation of the Turkish Republic, apparently Turkish food was divided into two major categories, your classic Turkish dishes and then your regional Turkish dishes, right? And classical Turkish dishes would have basically been kind of a carryover from the Ottoman era, maybe kind of the palace foods kinds of thing, whereas regional dishes more reflected the various geographies and cultural backgrounds of people across um, the land. So I, I think that there's a sense in which there's a lot of continuity, both through the ages and potentially even through the social classes of um, different types of food. Now, now meat, for example, is, you know, is, even today and to a degree is, is, I mean, that's, it's almost like more of a seasoning in certain parts of Turkish food rather than the, the main dish. I mean, that really depends, I think, on what part um, of the country. And if you're more in like the Gaziantep area, I mean, it's very meat heavy, you know, but I mean, even the use of meat in dishes varies, um, from region to region. So, yeah, so there's, uh, there's, you know, I think a lot of continuity on that level, but yeah, you, you mentioned the, the Rumi thing. I mean, so that's something, I don't know how familiar people are with, with Turkey and, uh, like Sufi, uh, Sufism, but you know, Konya, a city in Turkey is kind of like, the place that you go, you know, for Mevlana or, or Rumi. And apparently, you know, th th there's a rich food tradition coming from Sufism that it even endures today in Konya. I was looking through some of the recipes and I mean, it, it seems like pretty, you know, recognizable stuff. It doesn't seem way out there. Um, like there was a pilaf dish made with bulgur, which is cracked wheat and, you know, chestnuts and stuff. So I mean, it's very recognizable stuff to kind of the, the modern Turkish sensibility, but apparently has its roots back from Rumi. I mean, Apparently, it was so important that one of his chefs, um, Atish Baz, <laughs> which, what does the Baz suffix mean? <laughs> it's like, I, do you remember? I, yeah, I'm blanking. Atish Baz is like player, someone who like plays with something. Yeah. So when I read oh, Atish right. Baz, yeah, I'm thinking like firebender, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the guy's name was Atish Baz, and he's the only, I guess, uh, chef who's ever gotten, um, been like, what's the word? Uh, turbe, what is that? Like, um, in tomb, canonized. like in a mausoleum. Yeah. 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 Like, canonized yeah. sort of in, in 1285, apparently around there. Like, and so even, I guess, people wanting to enter the, the tarikat, right? Like the, the place of learning, uh, if you wanted to become the dojo, kind of a, one could say the, <laughs> the, the, the the Sufi dojo. Apparently, Turkish you started listeners are shaking their head now. Yeah, Kusura yeah, Um But there's a there. Apparently, you would start your training in the kitchen. You would sit on this like pole for three days and just watch the different people serving and doing their different things. And after that, if you wanted to stay, you started your lessons and your tests in the kitchen, right? And so, I mean, I think this really highlights even like historically and religiously some of the importance of food um, in one of the traditions uh, of you know, faith expressions that you find still in Turkey um, today. So it's, yeah, really interesting stuff. Yeah. And one, um, I, I, I used to read a lot about this and, and I've forgotten most of it, just kind of like the culinary history of cuisine. Um, one thing I think I remember is um, my professor, when I was doing my master's, he was a German gentleman named Christoph Neumann, who is a very eccentric fellow. He had the facial hair of like a 17th century German diplomat. I mean, it's sideburns, but they went down about eight or 10 inches. It was, uh, wow. I, I have no category for him, but he was uh, a very accomplished chef and he l had studied the history of Ottoman cuisine. I think mm -hmm. one thing he mentioned is that with um, spices, uh, Turkish or Ottoman cuisine, whatever you want to call it, used to have things like um, saffron. So a lot more saffron, mm -hmm. a lot more cinnamon, mm -hmm. partly due to the fact that um, Istanbul itself was on the terminus of, um, it was a route for the Silk Road and then also a route for the Spice Road. So part of the reason the Ottoman Empire accrued so much wealth in its early stages in the 1400s and 1500s is before the Age of Discovery really kicked in hard. 
Uh, if Europeans wanted luxury goods, which were mostly spices and things, much of it traded hands through the Ottoman Empire, from India, China, through different caravan routes, through the Ottoman Empire, and then through Europe uh, to the Mediterranean ports and then on to the rest of Europe. So much of that would pass hands through there, and then these very expensive spices were put on foods. And I went to a restaurant. It was a Turkmen restaurant from the nation mm. of Turkmenistan, and they had this mm. chicken that they put saffron on. It was awesome. It mm. was um, we, like in American cuisine, we don't really put saffron on much of anything. It's crazy expensive here, um, so that's probably yeah. reason. I think is it is saffron is it cheaper over there, or maybe like, or is it crazy expensive there too? <laughs> No, I mean, it's interesting because saffron, when you buy it here, the good stuff is, yeah, like uh, Iranian saffron, you know? I mean, yeah. I think there's kind of a Turkish saffron, but I wonder if that is a little more like turmeric where it's it's there for the color more than the taste yeah. kind of thing, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, um, but yeah, I, I actually think that, I mean, saffron is, is one of those things that I haven't really run into almost anywhere here. I mean, you have it in paella, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. having like Spanish cuisine. Uh, I mean, that has been my primary like reference point for its application, but I, I don't know if I've ever seen it in a restaurant here, actually, in contemporary Turkish cuisine. Yeah, so I think they've really, um, they, they've, they've taken the best from different places, so have shed mm -hmm. its Central Asian roots, which, Central Asians, I love you, but um, man, your horse milk, I just, I could not wrap my taste buds around that, or the horse meat in the horse Scott. milk. Scott, Or horse Or milk. am I missing? For, fermented horse milk is the precursor to iron. I mean, you got to remember where really? it came from. Okay. So, I mean, well. so yogurt, right. So, okay. <laughs> so, so, so yogurt, right. I mean, people, when you think about the history of yogurt, like people will say it's probably started around 5,000 BC, about the time mm -hmm. where animals were being domesticated. Right. You know, apparently around 2000 BC, as people were storing like milk and like, you know, animal intestines or stomachs or whatever you're getting the bacteria and the heat and you're starting to get yogurt but you know fast forward a lot Genghis Khan apparently fed his army with yogurt slash fermented horse milk right so still there um, and potentially mm -hmm. this kind of precursor to our modern day much loved iron <laughs> And yeah, like you said earlier, I think um, one of the few, if perhaps only words in the English language that comes from Turkish is yogurt, yogurt. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so if you're having your low calorie Danone yogurt um, that you're having after your hot yoga session, keep in mind that it originated was fermented horse milk that fed the armies of Genghis Khan as they were right. going through the Khwarizmian Empire, plundering and destroying and leveling ho total villages. So... From that, fe feeding and nourish uh, nourishing a horseback-mounted archer who's taking out villagers to the everyone after the hot yoga session enjoying the after-class snack with their, um, you know, activated anti or microbial yogurt. There it is. And so, in addition to that, if after your hot yoga session and you're in New York City and you headed over to, say, Kotz's Deli for a pastrami sandwich, you will also be eating a dish that the... <laughs> <laughs> the same kind of army would have produced because apparently as far back as like, you know, so posturma, right? It sounds a little even like pos pastrami, which I think that, you know, the etymological origins are, are, uh, are there. But I mean, as, huh. as apparently that it comes from, there, there's some arguments over where the word come from, but the Turkish term posturma to press. So apparently posturma, which it's, it's a cured meat kind of like, uh, brisola, uh, the Italian brisola, um, it was cured and it was placed under the saddle. So, and, and as, so they would write on it, it would be pressing it down. There's also apparently accounts of being, being pressed under or between the legs. Um, apparently Amanius Marcellinus, uh, wrote about it, uh, in his time with the, the Huns, um, using this meat, but apparently these, <laughs> your, uh, so your Chobani and your pastrami sandwich would have gotten you through a lot of conquest, um, and I mean, and so it's got these roots way, way back. Fun fact on Chobani, it's called Greek yogurt, but it was started by a Turkish guy who missed Turkish yogurt and thought, I need to bring Turkish yogurt to America, and for some reason thought, no one's going to buy Turkish yogurt, I'm going to call it Greek yogurt, but I mean, Choban is shepherd in, you know, Turkish, so it's, yeah, he's, <laughs> this is where it comes from. <laughs> Right. And uh, like Greeks will always claim, oh, this food, Turks claim it's theirs. It's actually ours. Turks will do the same. And it's very, very, very similar, all mixed around. Um, and another thing you mentioned with um, things that would go back to a glorious uh, 
warrior martial culture past that has now been distilled into, you know, sandwiches at a deli and hot yoga. Um, I think I saw a so, um, coiffure. Coiffure is a, like a hair uh-huh. salon. Um, and a lot of times in places in Istanbul, the name of the owners, it will be on the establishment. It was hair salon owned by Genghis and Attila, Chingiz and Attila. So Attila the Hun, Chingiz, a somewhat common name in Turkey, which is Genghis. Um, so uh, I wonder what the horseback mounted archers would uh, think as they're looking to what has come about now. Uh, it's, um, uh, totally. and, you know, we're, we're almost like, like you mentioned that story and I've heard a lot of things. We're kind of entering the realm of uh, Turkish nationalism where people will claim everything of everyone else's history as theirs that, mm-hmm. um, Ataturk loved doing this. I think he claimed that the Irish were actually Turks because the suffix IR is a suffix in the Turkish language and super nationalistic Turkish history, which isn't even taught in Turkey in the more in the 30s and 40s is, oh, the Hittites, they were actually Turks. The Sumerians, they were actually Turks. Any great civilization, it was actually the Turks. And then they did a costume change and became the Greeks. And they did another costume change, became Romans. And, oh, these um, Native American languages in Cherokee, Here's a few words that sound like words in Turkish. That's actually, you know, they're speaking Turkish. So everything comes back from here. And it, um, yeah. uh, so we have plenty of like Turkish nationalist theories. Well, it's, so, and on that too, with the, with the idea, I think two of the most hotly contested, like food, food culinary things here are going to be Turkish coffee, which is anathema mm. to some people just by its name and baklava. Right, those are the things where it's like, oh man, this this is ours, and and people from all over the region. Is it Turkish coffee, Greek coffee, Arab coffee, Arabic coffee? You know, there's there's all these different things, and so just Turkish coffee. Interestingly enough, apparently, coffee doesn't come from Turkey. By the way, Turkish coffee, I think, can potentially be a misnomer in like, oh, this is really good coffee from Turkey. Turkish coffee is actually a preparation technique. It's not actually like the source of the coffee, right? So Mm -hmm. historically, I mean, coffee came from Yemen, apparently back in the 16th century uh, to Turkey from Yemen. Um, And the, the idea of Turkish coffee is the preparation technique is you grind the coffee super fine. I mean, finer than espresso. You would grind it for espresso and you brew it in a little pot called an ibrik or a jezve. And when you dump it out, so if you want sugar in it, you actually put it in it while it's brewing. And then you dump it into a little cup, grounds and all. So what you never want to do if you're served Turkish coffee is to immediately take it and start drinking it because you need to let the ground settle, number one. And as you get close to the bottom, just be careful, be delicate, or you just you get a mouthful of sand, basically. You know, it's, uh, um, but I mean, tur- yeah, it's Turkish coffee, I think it, it's, it's great. Uh, there's a lot of culture and customs um, surrounding it. I mean, people use the ground for grounds for fortune telling after you drink it. You know, that's a traditional thing. Apparently, so in uh, Turkish society, you know, when to an American audience, if you say like uh, proposal engagement, it's down on one knee at a restaurant with a ring, right? You know, here when you talk about proposal, it's both families sitting across from each other in a house you know, going through this ceremony. And so I guess historically, especially before you would really, the bride and groom would meet before the proposal ceremony. If they came together and saw each other for the first time and the bride was like, yeah, this isn't going to work for me. You know, she, she makes, she has to make everybody Turkish coffee and she throws salt into the groom's coffee as a way to be like, take, pack up your parents and go home. This isn't going to work, buddy. You know, it's a, it's kind of a, you know, a little soft power, like signal there kind of thing. So You know, it's definitely, you know, coffee. I mean, coffee is so fundamental that the word for breakfast in Turkish is named after coffee, right? Kavialta. So, before coffee. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the little cups there, it's a totally different experience. And there's a funny apocryphal story that the reason coffee exists in the West is because of Turks. Because in the second siege of Vienna in 1683... The Polish army came from the north and the Ottomans were flanked and caught completely unawares. So they had to abandon their camp and flee and left in their back camp were sacks of coffee. This made that way into the city of Vienna, which established coffee shops. Now, that's not true, listeners, because um, it's not like the Ottoman Empire only had war with Europe. Obviously, there was also a robust trade relationship. So coffee was being traded to Europe. There were coffee shops uh, in England well before the siege of Vienna in the 1600s. And then when coffee takes place in America, that's mostly coming from the Caribbean and those plantations instead of the Ottoman Empire. But it's a great story. So that's why things stick because of fun stories like that. And yeah, I mean, Tur- Tur- Turkey is getting a lot more fit de cave, the filtered coffee like we would have in America. 
um, but it is not, um, but in T and, yeah, there are, the, there are these things that are so fundamental, we don't even think to mention them. Tea in Turkey is mm-hmm. omnipresent. There is no yes. word that manages like tea in Turkey. Sometimes a Turk, they're probably drinking like 20 cups a day in these tulip-shaped glasses. Sometimes you yep. just turn around and then you look back and there's a cup of tea in my hand. Where did this come from? This is um, <laughs> like, I don't know, can you articulate the omnipresence of chai or tea and they call it chai um it's not like don't think of our chai tea in america but um just like where does that come from or just like yeah yeah i mean it it really is everywhere i and the sound so you typically tea comes in like in a little tulip shaped glass it probably holds like what three ounces maybe it's a pretty small glass and it's usually served with one or two sugar cubes on the side i actually don't put sugar in my tea because i don't just want to eat sugar all day basically (laughs) which is It's usually, it's really funny because when I sometimes, yeah, I, I can distinctly remember no moments where I'm like, oh, I don't. And, the, and you, even the way you say it in Turkish, like, I don't use sugar. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, I don't smoke kind of thing, you know, yeah. like, uh, and people are like, wow, you're so healthy. I'm like, because I don't want like 10 sugar cubes a day. <laughs> I just, uh, anyway, but the, the sound though of stirring the sugar cube into the tea with a little spoon, that little, you know, tinkling noise. I feel like that's one of the hallmarks of just a sound that you hear in Turkey everywhere you know i mean it's definitely it's funny because turkey turkey is known for turkish coffee but it is definitely a tea culture i mean overall so yeah, i think per capita has the highest tea consumption of anywhere in the world um it, it's almost it would have been easy to forget mentioning it because it's like a fish mentioning water yeah, where it's exactly. so much of life um but if you were the first time you would come there you notice that everyone is drinking from these little tulip cups <laughs> if you have any kind of meeting there's someone there who's bringing chai to you there's yeah it um and- it, yeah, and, and I mean, for a, for a tip too, if you hopefully will travel to Turkey and experience this for yourself, the way they prepare tea in Turkey is they prepare tea as like a concentrate in one kettle, and then there's hot water. So when you when you serve yourself tea, you pour a little bit of the concentrate, say, you know, 25% of your glass, and then you fill the rest with water to dilute it. So I, I definitely have seen, you know, tourists visiting uh, Istanbul, and they'll come in and they'll just fill their entire cup with the concentrate, <laughs> you know? So just, you know, just so you know, when, when you come, it's also, a, this is just a great place to ask somebody to prepare it for you because usually people are very accommodating, but yeah. Yeah, there's a double but, pot where there's the main just hot water on one and the concentrate on top, yep. and then the yep. pot on the bottom is um, open so that the steam rises to the top. I made that mistake absolutely the first time I was there of just doing the concentrate. <laughs> And um, the like the right color consistency. Do they call it rabbit's blood? Is that a, is that a common yes. thing, or is that just me? When it's weird? when it when it like looks, I mean, yeah. Sometimes you know, I don't know if it's with a certain type of leaf or whatever, but it almost will take on like a uh, what's the word, um, like a, a red color, and they'll call that yeah, that's that's good, like rabbit's blood tea. So yeah. <laughs> Again, listeners, like it, it sounds better in Turkish, so just bear with us. If you <laughs> saw it with on a menu, you'd think what is going on here? What is um, uh, oh, yeah. So the other thing I can mention, so your channel, I mean, a lot of it is profiling specific restaurants and a lot of it is yeah. they'll they'll prepare things in a really unique way. So this was the totally um, Guy Fieri diners, totally drive ins and dives. I always get that mixed That's up uh, element. I mix where he's profiling really interesting places. And were there any that came to mind um, from your show or they do things due to this interesting historical quirk because every restaurant in Istanbul claims itself as being historical and or famous. It's always famous oh, totally. or historical. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's interesting. So thinking about that, so even the things available in a lot of these restaurants, like some of the fundamental ingredients they used, I mean, they, you think about like kebab even. I mean, kebab was almost necessitated by a nomadic culture, right? Like right. how that's how you cook things, right? From that kind of... Uh, of setting you know and so so you've got the you know how do i do just even thinking of cooking methods like kebab it's like how how do i cook meat out here when i'm traveling around well you put it on a spit and you cook it over the fire right or even preservation techniques right i mean it's interesting how much of like fundamental foodstuffs come from the necessity of having to preserve things without refrigeration right so and in uh in turkish cuisine or in, in in turkish yeah cuisine let's say there's a lot of even communal preparation things, right? So you need to preserve it, but it's not like you yourself are gonna preserve it. You as the village come together with the harvest and make, say, molasses. 
molasses is a really big deal in Turkey. You know, in America, you've got the cereal aisles with like 12 kinds, 12, like 1200 kinds of cereals. <laughs> and in Turkey, you've got shelves of molasses, right? You've got grape molasses and carob molasses and um, mulberry molasses. And you just, there's all these different, and because part of it is from the history where, you know, that was one way that you used fruit, right? You prepared it into molasses or you have tomato paste or you have pepper paste. Or there's a, ra and a rather interesting thing called tarhana in uh, Turkey where it was, okay, well, we can dry out meat, you know, and make sausage or uh, pasturma or whatnot. But what do we do with milk? Okay, we can make it into yogurt, but that still doesn't last very long. So they'd take the yogurt, some tomatoes, you know, some mint, uh, stuff like that. And, and now even they use like, I think like uh, chickpeas. You can put all kinds of stuff into it, onions. And you kind of mash it all up and you spread it out and let it dry. And it turns into the, like this powder. And they take that powder and it's almost like instant soup. Right, so this is like the, the original <laughs> from years and years and years ago, probably dating back to Central Asia and, you know, Turkey. It's like, this is the original instant soup. And, you know, they put it into, you know, whatever kind of liquid they have, uh, you know, beef broth or some kind of broth or hot water or something. You know, and so it's interesting to see, you know, the historical development of modern Turkish food being necessitated by their limitations on uh, both preparation and preservation. They spin gold out of yarn, though, with... Uh... It's incredible. So something that's uh, confused me in this discussion is we're talking about cuisine that's influenced by a Central Asian nomadic past and due to the Turkish people migrating west over several centuries. That's one element where there's this eastern thing. But then there's this whole Mediterranean element where it comes from the west. And I I, I can't wrap my... I mean, what's going on? The, there are these two, but... How yeah, can they work? I mean, that? It's interesting. I, I, when, you, when you think about like the geography of Istanbul, you have the Bosphorus Strait that cuts right through the city, which makes half of the city in Asia and half of the city in Europe. I mean, really geographically, it's like, man, it, it's how how would you describe it? It's sort of, it's sort of like the point at which East meets West. Hold, wait, 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 wait. Wait, but so, let me, hold, let me, no, let me wait, say wait, that again what? for your listeners. What? Wait, wait, <laughs> I mean, wait I, that's important enough to repeat. But, this is this is like the point where east meets west. Wait, but wow. no, but but it but it has to be all east. You know, it has to be completely culturally eastern. But then it has to be completely culturally western, and they're and they're walled off. I mean, it's they what? How how would what? Yeah. How would they meet? What? I yeah, I, I mean, I think I'm breaking your brain here, bam. But it's it's really east. Let me say this is where east meets west. Like. <laughs> So wait, wait. So it's the bridge. It's like a connection. Yeah. They're so they're uh -huh. they're meeting. They're meeting. And yeah. and, the, and there's actually bridges in Istanbul too that there, connect there are. them. What? This is so, like the bridge. So it's like they're a metaphor. Oh, so it's a. Oh, okay. Oh, oh whoa! Double rainbow across the sky. Um. So for listeners, obviously oh, Derek and I are doing a bit. Um, we're um, that's, but I, I think it's sort of when you read guidebooks uh, or anything, the Turkish Ministry of Culture, one of the very very first go to lines is Turkey is a bridge between civilizations where East meets West, and it's just, are are, are what are other cl uh, cliches like that? Bridge between Juxt civilizations. My favorite is juxtaposition. It's like there's so much juxtaposed here. You wouldn't believe the juxtaposition you see in the city between old, you know, old and new, modern and traditional, uh, religious and secular, and east and west. And it's like <laughs> juxtaposition. Yeah, like, yeah, like one I heard was where there was a mosque and next to it was um, a cell phone store with a tower. And someone says, oh, look at that. It's yeah. traditional religious and it's modern. And I think, well, I mean, like, what do you expect that their city zoning ordinance requires that Nothing, no modern technology can be between like 500 feet of a mosque. I mean, like, what do you expect? <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, it, and I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it definitely is overplayed, but I, that concept actually, you know, do you know who David Chang is, by the way? David Chang is like, I do not. He, he, he he's a restaurateur, chef, kind of, you know, he, he's one of the patron saints of like hipster foodieism. You know what I mean? Like, you could probably say. Um, and I think that, you know, he basically has said, like, Istanbul is, or Turkish food is, like, one of the most underrated cuisines. And, like, Istanbul itself is kind of like the, you know, he said OG 
the, the OG of fusion. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this is the place where f the idea of fusion began. You know, that's like a hip thing in culinary things now. It's like, oh, this is fusion food. It's like, that's just Turkish food history is fusion, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I, I am all about people experiencing, you know, that fusion, that meeting of East meets West kind of thing. You know, it, it definitely, I mean, because you think about, so, you know, in Northwestern China, you have the Uyghur people, which, you know, you can look them up online. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you should, and you should. Um, but, you know, it's it, their, their food, like La Man is kind of like Chinese lo mein, you know, and all the way down, like, like okay, so the, the like, pot sticker, like dumplings, right? I mean, Turkey has manta, which are like these little tiny meat-filled dumplings typically served with garlic yogurt and kind of a browned butter, you know, red chili um, sauce on top. Fantastic. You should try it. But, I mean, that is a distant relative, well, you know, cousin of, like, the pot sticker, the shumai, the the bao. Do you know what I mean? It's, you, you've got kind of the, the um, what's the word, as it's kind of come west and south a bit, you, you, it's changed and it, it's, it's become kind of what it is now. And I think... You know, it, it's almost like here you're eating, you know, the product of the progression of history, the movement of geography, you know, the, the, the taking on of different cultures and societies. I mean, it's, it's really like you're finding all these things coming together into the plate of food that you eat here. And I just, I think the rich history, you know, of the Turkish people, it, you really get it presented to you on a plate here and you can, you can really interact with it in a very visceral kind of way. I think it's, anyway, that's, what, that's why I love it, so... Yeah, I mean, there, there are endless things we could say about this that um, a lot of Turkish food would be recognizable to somebody who likes Greek food because it's very mixed in. But like you said, there's this um, proto pot sticker and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of noodles and things like that didn't even make their way to Europe until the Middle Ages. But it was there in the yeah. Ottoman Empire much before um, amongst the Turkish people, even before they migrated west. So yeah. that is why, like I mentioned in the prologue to this episode, um, check out Derek's channel because there's a lot of. Uh, stuff on YouTube food channels, and some of it is good. Some of it is some um, hipster stumbling to stumble, like, oh, you will never believe what I discovered. And they're basically on the equivalent of Times Square, and they're eating a slice of Sabaro pizza. Like, that's the equivalent of what they're doing with Turkish food. That They're going to the well most well-known restaurant, but, like, you would know it's what's like, oh, it's just, like, garbage, like, stuff that you shovel into your mouth. But Derek knows all the hidden gems of the city. So don't watch these other people's channel. Watch his channel. Um, any other, if people want to find you on the internet, on um, Friendster or uh, MySpace or uh, other channels, where do, uh, or there's other ones too, but I'm not really caught up on the latest channels. Where's the best place for yeah. people to find you online? My, MySpace is a little new for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so actually, I mean, we, we've definitely done some YouTube stuff. I think we're, we're trying to branch out channel-wise. So, But the one-stop one shop for everything is if you go to our website, it's um, meatturkey.io. And don't forget to put two T's. For some reason, it's really easy to pay me turkey. So it's meat and, oh, sorry, and meat too, like, please to meet you, not like beef, you know? So <laughs> meatturkey.io. If you go there, actually, the, the episode you mentioned with the funny food names or whatever, that it's that's on the front page of it too. You can find it there. And we're actually, you know, going to be start coming out with you know, we're, we've, I've talked up a lot about Turkish food and you're thinking, well, I'm, especially these days, I'm stuck at home. How wonderful. We're going to start putting out some content on how to actually make Turkish food at home, say in America, um, using ingredients you can typically find there. So uh, if you are interested in that, head over to the site and you can sign up and we, we can keep you updated with that. But yeah, that's coming. Check that out because Derek knows his stuff. So um Mr. Emai, thank you much for joining us and illuminating us with your knowledge. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That was great.